There we go. And we'll just give this uh, a quick read. So we have uh, Danny Thomas. She's been running a home-based business, unincorporated. So as soon as we hear that, we know she needs to do a T2125. She purchased it from a family friend on December 31st, 2018. On that date, she purchased all the inventory. So we know our opening inventory. She purchases all natural hair care products from various local suppliers and sells them online on her website, dragonesshair.com. Uh, she inventories the product in her home and runs the, the business primarily out of her house. So we, when we hear that, you know, that's her principal place of business. So we say, okay, she's, she's uh, going to be somebody who could claim a home use of home uh, deduction. Uh, her business is a sole proprietor. She has no partners. She asked you to complete her 2125 statement of business activities and provided us with a bunch of information. So the job is to take this information, put it into the right place, make sure that it is a deductible expense. If there's anything here that shouldn't be deducted, we should ignore it. Um, if there's anything that it like purchases that is a part of a calculation to get to what we can deduct, we have to put that in. Your ending inventory is given. So we have opening inventory, ending inventory, and we have purchases. Uh, we also have some Chapter 5 stuff here. Chapter 5 and 6 really dovetail together. So here's our um, purchases. We have the details on the home office. I, I skipped over that. Sorry. We have the details here on the home office, how much of a square footage she uses. So remember, your home office and your vehicle claims are prorated for the percentage that is um, business related, but on the forms you enter the total real world costs and then prorate the total to be the number that you carry forward and deduct. Uh, these are all the potentially capital purchases that would need to, to um, have uh, CCA calculated and factored in. Uh, there's some extra information here about an SUV that she bought that she's using. Uh, talks about borrowing money with an annual interest cost. So that's her vehicle, how much gas, insurance, repairs, repairs and maintenance, the new tires. Tells us a little bit about the customer list. Talks about a delivery truck that was sold. And here we go. This is what's required for you to complete the T2125 and um, really don't worry about the, these two parts here. Like just complete the T2125. Um, carry forward amounts will be on the form. So that's going to answer itself, right? Do we carry forward anything for the home office? That sort of thing. And for C, it's saying when's her return going to be due. So you don't have to worry about that either. Just worry about completing the T2125 for this in-class exercise. And the answer to when, when this would be due, well, this is a 2019 tax return. So the due date is going to be June whoa, 15th. Twenty twenty, and that due date is still in place. Uh, there has been no change to that for COVID nineteen. Uh, we've got two more weeks uh, before our uh, personal tax season is over. Over here, uh, we still got a pile of those that we're in the middle of working on right now. For the next two weeks, I'll be reviewing and filling in these T twenty one twenty five. I mean, we've already done a bunch of them, but there's there's the last uh, few stragglers here to get through uh, over the next couple of weeks. So this is literally what we're doing in our office uh, right now. So this is a very important form. A lot of people uh, operate in this manner, and so they have to get this uh, completed for their personal taxes to report properly the 
net business income. So I'm going to uh, let you guys go ahead and you know spend the next uh, 35 minutes uh, working on that with me here to uh, assist you in any way you need. Um, so uh, uh, go ahead and remember, make sure that you have downloaded a fillable PDF in and opened it in a PDF software like Adobe. Don't do it in the browser. You might lose all of what you put into it if you do it in the browser. Make sure that you're working inside of um, a PDF software like Adobe. And then you can upload that uh, to the Dropbox. Okay, so I got a couple of questions here. I'm going to answer these. So um, as far as the due time for, for these quote unquote in-class assignments, at least we're starting them in class, um, just, you know, if you can submit it by the end of tonight, that, that's great. Um, and you use the same uh, Dropbox as uh, the last time. If you do need a little more time, you know, if you're not able to get it uh, finished tonight, that's that's fine. If you you know if you submit it tomorrow as well, it's more just to make sure that you've um, you know you've you've worked to fill in one of these forms and get a little practical experience with the form. Uh, and we're doing it as an in-class activity just so you guys can kind of ask questions as you're working on it and looking at it. Um, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Just you know, give it the good college try. Fill out as much as you can, um, and and yeah, try to submit that tonight if you can. That's that's preferable. But if it's tomorrow, that's that's not the end of the world either. If 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 you if you uh, uh, just can't, uh, if there's something else going on and you can't get it done tonight, tomorrow would be fine. There's no deadline on the Dropbox. Uh, however, I do want to um, at a future class, I'll put up the solution and we'll run through it. So um, uh, it'll be good to have it in, and then we'll we'll actually look at the solution as well, so that you guys can kind of see what it looked like. Um, so another question here: Are we marked on the work or the fact that we participate? Pass it in. So uh, it is a pass. Fail grade. So, in other words, it's uh, participation, if you will. So, oh, what that means is, you know, if you fill in fifteen percent of it, I would call that a fail. Um, most people always just you know, give it a good try. So that that, uh, that doesn't usually have to happen. So, as long as you give it a reasonable try, fill in you know as much of it as you can. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine. It, it, it's not being graded like you got an 82% on this, you missed three fields. This is just to get you working with the forms, get some experience. So I want to um, make sure you guys do that and submit it in, you know, give it, give it the best shot you can there. Uh, and it's just a, a pass-fail grade. So it's just a participation thing. Okay. Yes, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't forget your question there, Colton. So the the customer list that is one thing to um, consider because it's a good question. Which which is the customer list? So in note one, it says the customer list was acquired from a competitor who closed their business soon after the transaction. It contained a complete list. This is I'm looking to read here at note one. So, sorry, the customer list was acquired from a competitor who closed their business soon after the transaction. It contained a complete list of the customer's current and past customers, including their email addresses, which Danny was planning to market to with an email campaign. So sometimes a customer list could be considered capital in nature. 
In this case, I would suggest that this is an expense. It's more of a marketing expense, meaning we're not buying the customers or Danny isn't buying the customers. She's buying a list of old customers that were customers of a business that closed because she thinks they would be a good group of people to market to. She's getting an email list and she's going to blow out a marketing campaign to that email list. She's not actually acquiring the customers. So I would consider that a marketing advertising type of an expense. So I've got the question here. Uh, would the wages for the one shipping employee be included in the cost of goods sold section? So that's another good question. That's one of those ones where it's a little bit of a gray area, right? It could be one or the other. Um, in that case, uh, to be for, for me, where I would put that person is in the cost of goods sold section. So I'm just going to answer that in the COGS section. And the reasoning for that is because the, the sales, there was a shipping charge. So it says sales and shipping charge is 112,000. It doesn't break them into two, but that's a, a direct part of it is that they're shipping it and they're charging for that shipping. So there's a revenue and a direct cost. So uh, I would consider the shipping wages to be a direct cost related to the shipping revenue. Now, with that said, if you put that in on the other page just under the regular wages and salaries that's fine it's just that's i mean it's still going to be deducted either way it's more like CRA has these classif classification systems that give the general uh, index of financial information and you'll notice each of those lines has a little code like a little four digit code next to it so that's just for their classification of it um, you know, they would hope everybody kind of puts stuff in the same place, but they're going to all inevitably have people kind of mix mix and match things back and forth. To be 100% correct, I would put that under the direct cost category. Those are good questions, folks. Good questions. guys are noticing what's uh you know a little gray or interesting or what do i do with that the other thing to be careful about with this is you've got a big old list of expenses so some of them might not be deductible at all also some of them you know be careful like uh property taxes here there's a property taxes here and there's a property taxes on the t2125 form or at least there's two different spots for property taxes so you got to make sure that ends up in the right place this is a person with a home office it could have been a person with a building paying property taxes where those property taxes were a 100 percent cost for the business here, the property taxes are a part of your home office. So you, so you have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it, not just match up the names. That would be another example of that. Uh, another good question. If she didn't keep a log of her kilometers, does she get to deduct her vehicle expenses? Um, so any expense that you are going to claim, you have to be able to back it up upon inspection. So that could mean um, being able to provide a receipt, you know, an invoice, evidence to the purchase, uh, and generally bank records, not good enough. That helps, but seeing that you paid money to somebody doesn't tell the auditor 
what you paid it for, how much the sales taxes were so they can take that out. Um, you know, it doesn't give you those details of what did they buy. So that's not good enough. So you generally need that piece of paper. Now, when it comes to uh, expense that you're going to prorate, particularly with a vehicle, um, you can evidence all the actual costs with the paperwork, but then the mileage, how do you evidence your mileage? So to answer Colton's question directly, um, the answer is yes, she could. However, um, by the letter of the law, you need to be able to prove it. And the way you would prove it is with the log. So if you don't have the log and you get a, a really nasty auditor, they could say, you have no evidence, forget it. That's not generally what I've seen. What I've seen in practice is for people who don't keep logs, which is many, the kilometers just need to be reasonable under the circumstances. So do the, do the numbers make sense for the type of business? If your business is a, a, a psychologist and people come into your home and you meet with them and then they leave, it wouldn't make sense that you drove 25,000 kilometers out of 30,000 kilometers for work because people are coming to you. It would make more sense if you drove three or four or five, right? Or maybe next to none, but a couple, two, three, you know, you got to go to the bank, got to go see your accountant, got to go to a conference, a little bit, right? So it has to be reasonable under the circumstances. Also a uh, notable item for this is that if you have, like for myself, I have, so I have an office in Burnside. So that's my principal place of business. So when I leave my home um, in Coal Harbor and I go to the office in Burnside, very short drive, but when I do that travel, that is not considered a part of my business travel. Everybody has to leave their house and go to their principal place of work. So I don't get to deduct that part. What I can deduct is after that, when I go, go to a client's office or you know, go to a meeting, meet up with somebody, um, any of the other travel that I might do for work, but it's after I leave the office, not from home to the office. So that's just kind of a important uh, note as well. So anyways, back to the original question. In, in real practice, you're probably gonna still get away with the deduction um, as long as it's reasonable and as long as you can kind of explain it, like say, well, I drive about four times a week to this place and five times a week to that place. And, and that sort of thing. The proper advice, the best practice is keep the log. If you have the log, as long as the log also itself seems reasonable and, and doesn't seem like uh, it's untrue, then that's the evidence. That is your backup. That is your invoice, if you will, for the kilometers. So that's the safest bet. That's what people should do. That's what, what CRA likes to see. But there's always a reasonability factor as well. So the sale of the truck is an interesting one, right? Uh, we have another question here about the sale of the truck. So how would we handle that? So they purchased a delivery truck for $6,000. And then in note two, it says the delivery truck was sold on November 30th. So they sold it before the year was even over. Bought it for $6,000, sold it for $4,500. Um, so they got some use out of it, but ended up selling it at less. So how, how do we handle that? It's a capital item. It's capital asset for the business. It was a delivery truck. So this, this would be like our chapter five stuff for this, right? So we would put 6,000 into class 10. And then when we sell it, we have to decide, do we the less we have to remove from the pool? So we have a class 10 pool of 6,000. We add 6,000 in, then we have to remove the lower of proceeds or disposition. So we remove the 4,500. 
So I'm just going to put this into the chat. So we have class 10. We add the 6,000. Then subtract lesser of cost and POD, which is 4,500. And where does that leave us? That leaves us with a UCC of $1,500. So this is chapter five stuff. We only had the delivery truck in the class, right? We didn't have anything else in that class. So what, what, what can we do then? Bingo. <laughs> I like it. I was <laughs> I was waiting for uh, for answers. I like this. I like a little back and forth between us. It's good. <laughs> as much I know it's it's weird doing this uh, online, but as much as we can uh, interact, I, I think it's great. So um, Colton says CCA everything, and Sarah says terminal loss. So uh, Sarah wins the prize tonight. Sarah is correct. Ding ding ding. ding. So terminal loss of $1,500. Now, that's because there was no assets left in the class. So I think probably Colton was thinking the same concept, which is we've got to flush it through CCA, right? We, you know, UCC needs to be zero. Well, the only slight difference in how this actually ends out is that it's it's not a part of the CCA. It actually shows up in that kind of other expenses section as a terminal loss. So you can, now they don't have a, a Giphy code. There's not a four digit code there for that. You can just put it in. It's weird, they should, but it just shows up there as an other, as a terminal loss. It's not technically a part of CCA because you're not claiming CCA on it. You're claiming a terminal loss. And effectively, that gets UCC back up to zero. So you would, you would put that in um, just on the, uh, the, the part four. Uh, so I'll just say this. It's... Um, Include at the bottom of part four in the others is how you would handle that. Uh, oh, I had a question. Uh, sorry, uh, just to make sure we're clear here on the ordering of these answers. So um, uh, there was a question, where do we need to put the capital gain? That's not the question I was answering here. So when I said include at the bottom of part four in the other section, so terminal loss is included at the bottom of part four in the other, quote unquote, other section. Just to clarify, that's the, the question I was answering. So um, <clears throat> the other question here, where do we need to put the capital gain? So what, uh, in, in the question there about capital gain, um, what asset are, are we referring to uh, as having uh, been disposed of at a capital gain. Okay, so the delivery, yeah, so I, I believe in the question, um, so the only disposal in the question is the delivery truck, I believe. That's right. And 
and the truck is a terminal loss, not a capital gain. So it's it's kind of like the opposite. Um, we bought it for six thousand. We sold it for forty five hundred. So we took a loss on it. Um, but we do that based on the pool. The pool is a class 10 pool. There could have been other vehicles in there, but there wasn't. So when that truck left, we had 1,500 left in the pool when that truck was disposed of. So now we have no underlying assets, but a $1,500 balance that we need to flush. So we do that as a terminal loss. No problem. So that um, is something that, that students often kind of mix those up, right? So make sure from, from chapter five that you're real clear on recapture, capital gain, and terminal loss. It's easy to mix those guys up. And sometimes the recapture and capital gain can both happen together. That, that happens often as well. Okay, Mark, how do we determine how much of the house payments can be deducted? So, uh, okay, I'm just going to catch this. No HST calculations are needed. So, um, as far as HST, you, you don't need to do anything with that. There's no HST calculations necessary in this question. Um, back to Mark's question. So how do we determine how much of the house payments can be deducted? So that's a little bit of a longer answer. Um, so step one, we need to go and find all of those expenses. So that would be the mortgage interest. Here, let me pick a different color here. I'll, I'll put blue lines next to it. So the mortgage interest, the electricity, the home insurance, Property taxes. Am I missing anything? Oh, I think that's it. So this little group right here is our home office expenses. Okay, good question. Uh, follow up here, possibly the telephone. So the telephone, like if we kind of look through all these expenses, you need to separate almost into three categories. You're going to have um, uh, what I'll call, um, I don't know, you're, you're, let's, let me, I'll type it up here. So you kind of need to, uh, strategy, strategy is to categorize into three, Buckets, if you will. One being the 100% business expenses. Two being the home office to be prorated. And three, the personal vehicle to be prorated. Now, you could have a vehicle that is 100% for the business as well. Like that delivery truck, we were considering 100% for the business is what we would have done with that. So you have those direct business costs. And on your, on your T2125, those 100% direct business costs will go in part four, you'll just put them straight in. So for instance, your business insurance of 1200 would go in line 8690. It just goes straight in because it's business insurance, right? So that's a, that goes straight in. But we also have home insurance. Well, the home insurance goes over to the, the section for home office on the 2125. 
So that ends up going under insurance in part seven. So in part seven, you should have electricity, insurance, maintenance, and mortgage interest. Those should all be totaled. You'll get a total of 13,790. That's your, your check figure for part seven. And then it's given uh, here in the question, right? We're told that we're using 150 square feet out of 1,000. So that's your, your prorated amount. So we're going to use 150 out of 1,000 is your your pro rate for the square footage. So if you just take 150, you know, divide by a thousand, basically that tells you that that it's it's gonna be 15% for business, 85% for personal. So you take the total costs, you subtract, the 85% to equal the 15% deductible. So in this question, um, you're going to end up, your, your check figure for this, so you're going to have 13,790. So it's going to look like this. going to be 13,790. So, oops, 790. Subtract. Eleven seven twenty one fifty, which is going to equal two oh six eight fifty. So if I double check that math, two two oh six eight fifty. 206850 divided by 13,790 is 15%. Perfect. Give me the right numbers. So that's the amount of deduction that you can claim as long as there's net income to claim it against. And in this case, uh, there is plenty of net income. So in this case, we're not going to end up with anything to carry forward. So probably the most tedious part of this, once you kind of put it together, is probably that CCA section. Um, area B, uh, Sarah's got a question. Area B, details of equipment additions for the year does not have enough lines for all the additions. Yeah, good, good point. Um, I should have mentioned that before. Um, let's see. Yeah, because there's quite a few additions there uh, to show. Um, I'm, you guys can just, just, just put a couple, just use as many as you can, and then just don't worry about the rest. You're going to add them in, um, up above in the main part of that table. So, so that's fine. If you, if you run out of space, just, just don't worry. You just leave, just leave, uh, leave the rest of them out. That, that section is just simply saying, um, here's what I'm adding to this class. Here's what I'm adding to that class. And, and then those numbers show above in column number four, or sorry, uh, column number three. So just the answer again is just put as many as you can as an example. You know, if you're doing it in software or whatever, it would give you as many 
as many fields as you needed. Um, the fillable PDF isn't isn't a perfect uh, perfect uh, example that way, I guess you could say. Uh, what is the total CCA for the year? Okay, yeah, sure, I can help you guys out a little bit with this one. Give you a check figure. Because again, this is just for participation, right? So here is CCA. So it might be a little tricky, the CCA. Here we go. $4,637.50 is the total number. One, one note uh, is to remember that we've got some special rules around class 10.1. Oops. Class ten point one. Uh, oh, also, um, uh, I should also note the uh, class 10.1, that's um, that's a uh, that vehicle, let's see here. That vehicle has a, uh, like a uh, percentage usage as well. Right, so that's going to be prorated. So that one's a little bit tricky. So, um, so think about like half year rules limits, half year rules, cost limits, and prorating. The CCA based on kilometers. So that was a luxury SUV of eighty thousand. But you can only claim 30, right? So you have to cap it at the 30. Uh, also, it's used 15% of the time for business. So we weren't given the actual kilometers, but 15% of the kilometers are for work. So any CCA claim you calculate, you're going to have to do it by 15%. That one's a little bit of a tricky one there. Oh, a couple of couple of twists and turns to that one. Um, for the vehicle, the interest, the 6,000, remember that's going to be limited by your $10 per day. That's another trick there. Okay, Colton asks a good question here about the accelerated investment incentive.
So I think we have a little bit of exceptions here um, in class 12. I think we have an exception. Check for that. Yeah, actually, um, just gonna let that solution figure I gave you. Um, this 10.1 vehicle in the solution I have is doing half year rule. I'm not sure why that is. Let's check in on that. Uh, as far as eligibility for the accelerated investment incentive, that kicked in for um, for use after November twentieth, twenty eighteen, and it goes all the way up to twenty twenty eight. So that sucker is going to be around for a while, uh, but it will go away again. Um, There are some exceptions. So in general, all classes of depreciable assets can be eligible for that accelerated initial uh, initiative, incentive, I should say. Um, there are some exceptions to, to kind of be clear. Um, the manner in which the asset is acquired can cause it to be non-eligible. So there are um, some things, you know, the asset was previously owned by the same taxpayer owned by a non arms length person, acquired on a rollover basis. So some of that stuff was covered in the, the lecture um, on, um, on chapter five. Um, but that, uh, I don't think any of those situations were given in this question. Um, and again, not to be confused, it doesn't matter if it's a used vehicle, it's just about being previously owned by the same taxpayer. That's what they mean by previously owned. There's... Uh, for class 12... Um, Class 12 assets generally qualify for 100% write-off in the year of acquisition. So given that, the federal uh, government had decided that, that for class 12, the accelerated program is, is not necessary. So with respect to medical and dental instruments, uniforms, chinaware, and tools costing less than 500, their cost could be completely written off in their year of acquisition. As a result, uh, it would not have been possible to increase the acquisition year CCA for those assets. However, uh, some items included in class 12 were subject to the half year rule, resulting in a CCA uh, deduction for the new acquisition of only 50%. So as an example, computer software, um, also certified Canadian films, that's not relevant to this. So computer software, will be subject to the half year rule. Uh, so somewhat surprisingly, uh, this was not changed. So class 12 assets continue to be limited to a 50% write-off in the year of acquisition. So for, for the, remember class 12 has two different groupings, one with the 50 uh, or the uh, half year rule and one without. So that's where that factors into this one. So class 12 uh, would be an exception. And in this exact question, uh, what did we have here for class 12? Uh, we had accounting software 
five hundred dollars. We had small tools seven fifty each under five hundred dollars. So computer software is subject to the half year rule. So that's so you're not going to be able to deduct in the same year everything in that category. So class twelve is one exception uh, to answer your question there, Colton. Um, the check figure that I gave you factors that in the half year rule on the five hundred dollars for the um, you know so one half of the five hundred for the software. Uh, but for ten point one, the check figure I gave you was also doing a half year rule on the 10.1 vehicle, which was limited to 30,000 in the first place. Um, I'm not 100% sure why that is. Let me see. Let me see. Um, okay, so we have some other uh, class 13, which is not in this question, but class 13, your leasehold improvements. Um, just as a side note, um, class 13 was one of the classes that was subject to the half year rule. Um, so the accelerated initiative removes that old half year rule. However, instead of adding 50% to the base um, for calculating CCA, it allows the taxpayer to deduct 150% of the regular straight line amount. So there's just a little bit of different calculation there. So there is some effect on class 13. That was a, another note for that. Um, class 14 is also a straight line class. Again, not in this question, but that one's also a straight line class. Uh, it didn't used to be subject to half year rules. So there was no need to remove the half year rule. So class 14, that accelerated adjustment is implemented in the exact same manner um, as with any of the declining balance classes. So that's another uh, note. Uh, I don't think uh, that there was anything for class 10.1. So that might be a move in the solution number I gave 